Hey everyone, my name is Michael Lunger. Welcome to Telling Your Science as a Story. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. We are going to help you be better science communicators by using stories to tell your science. This workshop is part of a series on social media communications created with support from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Pacific Institute on Pathogens, Pandemics, and Society. To access other workshops in the series, visit youtube.com slash at pips bc, that's P-I-P-P-S bc. And before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that the Simon Fraser University respectfully acknowledges the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Katsi, Quiquetlam, Kakite, Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Sawasan peoples on whose unceded traditional territories our three campuses reside on. Now, for this workshop, by the end of it, you're going to be able to describe the value of storytelling for communicating with the public, apply a storytelling framework to a health or emergency preparedness topic, and revise your story to make it more accessible to a broad audience by removing jargon. Like I said, my name is Michael. I am a professional science communicator. I have many different roles. My main role is at the HR McMillan Space Center. I'm the program coordinator there. I am a mentor. I am also a trainer for a lot of our staff and a variety of different spaces, usually talking about space, the universe, but sometimes encapsulating everything underneath the universe. And uh, in my other side job, I am with Nerd Night Vancouver, which we are in informal space for scientists to tell their stories. Uh, we converted that to a podcast podcast over the pandemic, but our in-person events are coming back. So if you're in Vancouver, look us up. We're going to be having some events uh, hopefully coming soon. This uh, I'm recording this in the summer of 2023, but we have some events being planned very soon. We turned that into a podcast, like I said, Nerd and About podcast. You can hear lots of different scientists telling their story on that podcast. If you're a podcast listener, check us out. My new role is also with the Science Fair Foundation of BC. I'm the outreach manager there. So I work a lot with kids on their first journey in being science communicators, science fairs. So amazing. So much energy and so fun to see kids on the beginning of that journey, just getting into science for the, for the first time. And I have a podcast there where I talk to some of those young scientists. It's a short form podcast called Let's Innovate. Check that out on all your social media platforms. Okay, so that's the background. That's it for me. I'm going to turn off my camera. We are going to get into the work. We're going to have a lot of fun. You are going to do some of the work as well. So there's going to be various times during this recording that I'm going to ask you to pause and do some work and hopefully have some fun. Okay, here we go. So we are going to tell science stories, like I said, and my background actually is in film, uh, which helps us tell a narrative when we get into stories. That's really what we're talking about here. Narrative is such a powerful, powerful tool. And you know that from the very first time that you start hearing about stories and you tell other people stories about a movie you just saw or just something you did we're all constantly telling stories to each other but this narrative framework really works well in a science context as well so as i delved into this topic you know i wanted to give you a whole bunch of research and a whole bunch of background into why storytelling is so powerful and as you can see there's a ton and ton of papers that have been written on this very topic but the thing is I've actually done this trap that a lot of science communicators fall into. Even in my day job at the Space Center, I ask a new employee to present on a new topic. And I'm presenting on this topic to you. And you do all of this research, all of this research, and you forget the one cardinal rule of what we're talking about here is that all of that can really lead you and distract you from the core message. What is the story and knowing is not equal to doing in this case so why don't we just get right into some practice what is it that i'm we're talking about here what is the story when it comes to science and facts and separating those two okay so here we go here is our first factual story and you may have heard this one before okay the queen died and then the king died. Pretty straightforward, right? This actually comes from E.M. Forster. 
But how about this? It's a very short story. It draws a cause and effect connection between the facts and emotion and conflicts. It helps us understand the situation more clearly by getting at the emotions and then the why. The queen died and then the king died of grief. Okay, so stories are not reports. They are journeys. And it's your job to take your audience along for the ride. We use stories to make sense of our world and to share that understanding with others. Okay, so what I want to do in my connection to you is I want to tell you about this journey that I have had quite recently, actually. And it actually came when the JWST, and we're going to actually get into acronyms and jargon in a minute, but the James Webb Space Telescope was launched and it was a big news story. So lots of reporters come calling the Space Center. They want to talk to someone about what's going on. And I talked to a reporter from the Vancouver Sun, and this is the end result of that conversation that I had with that reporter. And the headline is NASA's hot dust, steamy photos with Canadian connection capture the world's attention and the subheadline is the cosmic images revealed today are captivating not just for their physical beauty their glittering cliffs but for the power to move us and i was quite taken aback when i saw this headline because i had a very long conversation with denise ryan the reporter in this case and I found it interesting in hearing the questions that she was asking me because she kept on asking this why. Why does this matter? We have just sent up this really expensive telescope up into space, and I was talking a lot about the science and what it's going to do for the science, but Denise kept digging, why does this matter? Why does any person on the street that doesn't know the Big Dipper from the Little Dipper, why are they going to care about this super expensive telescope? And as I kept talking, I actually mentioned a line that is actually in the article, which is that I said, well, the reason that this telescope is a window into all sciences, and in fact, it's kind of not fair that the James Webb Space Telescope gets more attention than other science, but the reason that it does is because, and I just laid it out plainly, that space is kind of sexy. And she kind of like drew on that notion. It's like, oh, okay. And started to use these analogies. And if you look back to the headline, NASA's hot dust, steamy photos with Canadian connection capture the world's attention glittering cliffs, physical beauty. It was all about the beauty of the universe. Science is that. And that's what Denise was drawing upon. That's what was going to hook the readers and the layperson into the story. And I found that really fascinating that Denise used that very notion that we're going to get into, which is setting plus character plus conflict divided by time. Okay, so you don't need to get that specific for our purposes today. We can just start really with the basics. We have an intuitive understanding of what makes a story. Okay, it takes place in a setting with some character and a problem that introduces meaning and prompts action, which then has some outcome. And that all takes place over time, which is why stories have a beginning, middle, and end. Okay, but sometimes talking about stories and science can raise some alarm bells for a lot of us. And I'm sure a lot of you are feeling this sometimes when you're perhaps forced into this, perhaps you're forced to watch this video. And I say it takes practice. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to get into some practice. But what I want to say is that leaving out data that doesn't fit is a very common thing that happens. Okay, or one off anecdotes that can misrepresent a body of evidence or manipulating and persuading against science or overgeneralizing, you know, all of that hype. All of that happens when we start to talk about our science and lose track of what we're trying to do. It's this machine, you know, whoever is paying us to do this job, we are churning out this science and we're sometimes we get lost. 
get lost in what we're trying to actually do as science communicators, which is to tell a story. There are conflicts and failures that happen during that. And sometimes that reveals so much about the messiness of science. And I get really excited when I hear some of those stories because we love drama. <laughs> we love conflict. But as sometimes as science communicators, we avoid that. We want to make science this nice and pristine place that no conflict ever happens. But that's not going to capture the audience's attention. Sometimes you do have to lean into more of the sexiness of it, like Denise Ryan did. Sometimes we do have to lean more into the conflict and see what happens. So a well-told story can be extremely powerful. It'll capture attention. It'll inspire others and it can even lead to action, which I'm betting a lot of us and a lot of our bosses are wanting to see happen. And it resonates emotionally by putting the facts in a cause and effect context. And it helps that the facts stick by explaining how they connect to each other. So there are many interesting, sometimes elaborate descriptions of the parts of a story. You know, there's the classic story arc, sometimes as three acts, the classic three act structure, rising action, climax, a falling action. Some of you may have heard of a hero's journey, which is another classic model, the classic Star Wars model, where you have a hero that is called to action. This is classic. This goes way back to ancient Greek mythology, where they knew how to tell these basic stories. And a lot of that has not changed. You still go to see a movie. I'm sure you're going to see any modern TV show or movie in 2023 or whatever year it is that you're watching it. It is still the same types, structures of telling a story. Fundamentally, a story is about causes and effects, about problems and change. It's not just a list of things happening in a sequence. So we found a wonderful example from this science communicator, Randy Olson, why science needs story. Houston, we have a narrative. So if there's one book that you can go out there and read on this, I gave a whole bunch of citations at the beginning of this video you can go and check out any of those rewind and pause and look for any of those papers but this is actually a great book because it breaks down fundamentally how we can practice this and here's how it goes a story can be seen very simply as an and but therefore statement and this highlights it and this helps us break it down and this is how we're going to practice Okay, so we'll, we'll use an example of a story I hope a lot of you know. If not, I'm sure you've all heard of The Wizard of Oz. And here's how the story goes in this framework. A girl lives on a farm in Kansas. Her life is boring. But a tornado comes and sweeps her to Oz. Therefore, she must journey to find her way home and grow along the way. It seems very simple. It's a very simplified version. I'm using it as an example. Let's see how that looks. Girl in Kansas and boring, but tornado to Oz, therefore journey and growth. Now, when you're working on this and you're practicing this, boiling your science down into this very simple statement is not as easy as it looks. It takes practice. The first time that you do this, you're going to probably get a little frustrated. You're going to see, I'm going to throw in some examples and it's going to get a bit messy, but you keep working at it. And you can even go to imdb.com and you can see many people breaking down synopses of these classic stories. And you can even add your own. This is a classic film school endeavor. And in fact, it is a interview question that we ask at the Space Center when we're looking for people that have an intuitive understanding of how to break down a story. We ask in less than a minute, tell me about the latest movie or book that you have read or watched. And we can see very quickly if they have that sense, how do you break down a story to the, why is this important? What is the theme of this story? What is the theme of your science? Why does this matter? So what? 
Okay. Here's another example, another amazing example that you can apply this to almost anything. And this is from prolific science journalist, Ed Yong, who covered a discovery on lichen. Lichen, you know, just this stuff on the outside of rocks. It's amazing. And it was a popular story that people chose to read. Here's the headline. How a guy from a Montana trailer park overturned 150 years of biology. He chose an evocative headline and the difference between clickbait is that as long as you follow through on that headline and deliver on that promise that you're going to be okay. It's okay to pique people's interest. And then the sub headline, biology textbooks tell us that lichens are alliances between two organisms, a fungus and an algae. They are wrong. So then he does give information on lichen and these two blocks function as the first two blanks in our ABT statement, the and, but, therefore. There's this unique researcher, there's this existing body of evidence, but the finding of the research study that he's covering and the therefore is the concluding significance, which is also the headline. Researcher, field, established beliefs, third organism, and the so what. Break that down into our nice little framework here. Unlike a researcher and established field, but major discovery. Therefore, future possibilities. You can do that. You can be really kind of basic when you're breaking this down and of course, when you're using social media, you were very limited with your characters. So sometimes this can really help you really narrow down a story that you go on and on and on about, but really break it down into this framework to what it's all about. What is the story? Something and something, but something, therefore something. The way Yang structures it through a lens of and but therefore, he sets up that there's this unlikely scientist character that the existing established field of lichen research, but before now, they've never been able to grow lichen successfully. Why? Therefore, the scientists used genetic research tools to discover that there's actually a third organism that's behind part of the lichen symbiosis, changing the fields previously understood and opening up exciting new possibilities. He chose to center on the researcher, which is always an option depending on the fit of the story. You don't always have to go that route, but it's often helpful for the character to be the people. Scientists are people. They're real humans. Great way to just drop a real human person into your story is to focus on the researcher, the scientists. This is what we're trying to do in our field of science communication, break down the barriers between us and the general public to show that scientists are real humans too. We are all scientists. Science is a process. There are some people that get paid to do science, but they are just real people too. So here's where we get to our first activity. Here's where you get to practice on your science. So pause the video, use the framework that I have up on the screen and try this out. Like I said, it's gonna be messy. Just set a timer, set a timer for five to 10 minutes and just write down a bunch of things that you think can fit into this framework. Might not all fit right away, but try it out. See what happens and come back and we'll keep going. So, like I said, I was going to put in my own example and it was and to show you that it does get kind of messy. So here's one that I just wrote down recently in my new role at the Science Fair Foundation of BC. Science and STEM fairs sustain and enhance the science culture of youth 
and it gives kids the opportunity to embrace curiosity through science outside of the classroom. But science fair numbers are down significantly post pandemic. Therefore, we must engage with teachers and parents to show how science fairs can be beneficial to all school age children. Now, I could rework this a ton, and I will actually rework this a ton, but I wanted to show you this as an example because it might be very close to how some of you are taking a story or something that you're working on and you're trying to fit it into this framework. It can get kind of messy. I can boil this down. I'm going to use this as an example because we're going to get into some other ways to break down and analyze what I've just written here. And here's another example from directly social media. Health Canada and PHAC, a cannabis brownie can look like a regular brownie, but can cause severe poisoning in a child. If you're baking with cannabis, store the edibles out of reach and away from regular food and drinks. Keep it hashtag high and locked. Notice how in practice, the ABT statement is right in there, but you can boil it down to its bare essential. So there was only one line at the top, a cannabis brownie can look like a regular brownie. And then they skipped right to the butt can cause severe poisoning in the child. Therefore, if you're baking with hashtag cannabis, store the edibles out of reach and away from regular food and drinks. So let's get into jargon and something that we like to call the jargon garden in SciCats. Jargon garden. We're going to do some weeding. We are going to get into what jargon is, which is simply technical sub language. Users devise abbreviations and acronyms to help speed up processes and clarity. Jargon can go to the dark side when it's so dense that outsiders, anyone on the outside, remember those barriers, they have difficulty understanding it. And sometimes we're on the inside of it. We use that to protect us. If you understand the jargon I'm talking about, it's like this insider knowledge. It is to your detriment as a science communicator, but it's really easy to fall into. If you're having trouble communicating something, if you take five minutes to explain it with a graph, and if you're reading your thesis or just reading exactly what you wrote down, you might be jargoning. <laughs> So here's some examples, PCR, mRNA, a lot of ones that we may have been familiar with, synonyms, acronyms, overly complicated words, intellectual shorthand, it captures complex ideas in a few words. And sometimes we need to use them, but if we start using these all the time, who are we leaving out? My colleague Armin, who does all of these visuals for us, he has a great example because he works in this field and he is a scientunist and his job is to take some of these complex ideas and put them into really fun infographics or cartoons in this case. And the thing is, as he keeps working with scientists, sometimes they speak in this jargon language because they're only speaking to each other, which is the trap that we all have if we're only talking to each other in our science which is why it's really good to have outsider point of view. Sometimes just talking with your family or friends that aren't in your field can really help because if they are brave enough to say, hey, what is, what is that thing you just talked about, that acronym that you say 100 times a day? What actually is that? And in fact, in my work, I already did it in this workshop already. I said JWST, there's a reason for that, James Webb Space Telescope. But if I just kept saying JWST all the time, this fantastic new technology, JWST, a lot of people probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But sometimes commonly used acronyms can be helpful. WHO, it can limit the words, especially when you're using social media that limits the characters that you use. And sometimes acronyms can also be well suited for certain audiences. If you're trying to talk to a certain audience, IRL, I-C-Y-M-I, for audiences who spend a lot of time online. And here is 
an example that I found from the CDC. I found this handbook that I found really, really useful. And it's not even that old from 2016 that they published this handbook for all of their employees, everyday words for public health communication. And this is a great resource that you can find online. And I really encourage you to do it. I just picked out a few of my favorites. Contagious. Okay. Germs that have the ability to spread from a person or animal to another person or animal. The original sentence that they had to change, mumps is a contagious disease caused by a virus. It spreads through saliva or mucus from the mouth, nose, and throat. The plain language sentence that they revised it with, mumps is a sickness that can spread from one person to another. So they highlighted contagious as the jargon Weed to pull out, put in the plain language sentence. Contaminated, dirty, unsafe, not clean. The original sentence, when two or more people get the same illness from the same contaminated food or drink, the event is called a foodborne outbreak. Plain language revision. A foodborne outbreak is when people get food poisoning after eating the same unsafe food. Fantastic stuff. I really encourage you to go find the everyday words for public health communication. It's a PDF on the CDC website. So let's try it again. Second activity, pause the video after you've gone through this. Go back to your ABT statement. Think about the story. Think about the jargon that you used in that story. Or maybe there's another example of some of your writing. It doesn't matter. Pause the video here. What I want you to do is I want you to underline all of the jargon. See if you can do a little bit of jargon weeding in the ABT statement that you just wrote or a recent example of something you've just written. How would you define and adapt that identified jargon? Pause the video. And we'll come back for more. As an example... There's this readability scale, something that was published back in 1992 by Donald P. Hayes, when the growing inaccessibility of science was starting to become a thing, even way back then. And Donald came up with this readability scale that I think really nails the point of this growing gap between science, scientists and the general public. So the scale works like this. We have the Globe and Mail, New York Times, basic newspapers that lots of people read. That's at scale zero. Nature, cell, science, the science journals, that's at a 30 to 50. Okay? Discover Magazine, very popular magazine on a lot of shelves, even <laughs> reduced Periodical shelves in the local market, still there, minus 4.7. Kid Science, Ranger Rick, I had a subscription. Zebu Mafu, I'm not familiar with this one, but a lot of my colleagues also had a subscription, minus 22. You can already start to see the gaps starting to arise. Comic books, I have a bunch behind me right now, minus 26. Casual, adult to adult conversations, minus 41. Point one. This is what we're talking about, this huge gap. How we talk to each other is so far removed from how scientists talk to each other, or even how scientists write to each other. I'm pretty sure that even scientists, as they're talking to each other, they're not talking in the way that they write in these scientific journals. So that is not how we should be talking with the public. We should be dialing it down even more closer to that minus 41.1. That's what we're going for, especially when we're using public social media tools. If we're going to use those tools, that's where we should be aiming for. So let's do some more activities, more jargon. We can take that ABT statement and we can actually pump it into this website, splasho.com upgoer six. So you can put this into another window. And what it's going to do is going to color code the words depending on how common they are. Reds have low frequency, yellows medium, 
The goal here is to be using high frequency words most commonly. So how red is your example? So I'll just show you how this works. The upgoer six. So I put my example in there, science and STEM fair, sustain and enhance the science culture. And you can see the, where the red words are. And you can see where the green are the most common ones. Then you have sliding scale. Put a pause here, go to the upgoer six, put in your ABT and see what you get. As we move on, we can do this again with a de-jargonizer. We can use that same piece of writing that we just did. We can put it into the de-jargonizer here, scienceandpublic.com, and this will give you a more comprehensive result and tell you the suitability for a more general audience. The de-jargonizer wants you to have between 95 and 98% vocabulary comprehension. And here's the result of mine again. I'm at, I'm at 90, <laughs> so I'm not there. But I could keep working at it. I've got some jargon in there. I've got some ideas on how I might change it. How would you change yours? Pause the video again, pump it in to the scienceandpublic.com. Let's move on. Activity number three, we can keep reworking the concept. Maybe you found some surprises even in your own work. Go to the upgoer five this time. This is going to test you. How do you really know your topic? Can you explain your topic using only the 10 hundred most common words? So you'd have to, you'll go into the upgoer five and it'll show you what those 10 hundred most common words are. And this is a really fun exercise. You may not end up using the language from this website, but it's going to help you take out some of that jargon. This is a really good jargon garden tool. Weed the jargon out. And here's what that looks like. All the words <laughs> that are underlined are not in the list. A lot of non-permitted words. Science, STEM, fairs, sustain, enhance, science, culture. How would I rework that? just using the most common language. In order to take out the jargon plants, we've got to define them. Define them right away with an example relevant to the audience. Make sure you consistently use the phrase or term to avoid confusion. And get to that readability scale. You can even use Word. And there's a tool that will get you to what we're going for. Break it down. Less words per sentence. Never more than 45. Don't use long words. Which brings us to the end of this workshop. I hope that you have enjoyed watching Telling Your Science as a Story, De Jargoning Your Science. My name is Michael. I am with SciCats. You can find us online, SciCats.net, online, social media, at SciCatsYVR. This workshop has been in collaboration with Pacific Institute on Pathogens, Pandemics, and Society. We gratefully acknowledge funding for this workshop provided by the CIHR and PIPS. To access more workshops, go to youtube.com slash at PIPS. BC. I wish you all well. I wish you all good luck with telling your science as a story.